you know what? I want to be the kind of person where you can put me anywhere and I'll make it better. You want to be like that? Stay tuned. John chapter 13, and I want to read a very powerful story here. If you would, just read along with me. I'm going to start at verse 2. And supper being ended, that's important. The devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all, all things in his hands, and that he had come from God and he was going to God, he rose from So supper had ended, verse 2 and verse 4, he rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel. He girded himself, and after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that well, he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Simon Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I'm doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. Jesus said, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Peter said, Okay then, wash my, my feet only. Wash my head. Wash my hands. Wash. I love Peter. <laughs> Peter gives me hope. He just makes me feel better. I mean, just always does before he thinks and lives with his foot in his mouth. I just, he gives me hope. <laughs> he, he don't get what's going on here. He don't catch it. He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. You're clean, but not all of you. Now he's talking about Judas. He knew he who would betray him, so he said, you're not all clean. So he's not talking about cleansing the feet. He's talking about something internal. Peter's not catching on. For he knew who would betray him. Verse 12. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I've done? You call me teacher and Lord, and that's, you say well, for I am. If then I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 5. Let this mind, one translation says, this attitude, be in you which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took on the form of a bondservant, like a man. Jesus' name, eternal name, was not Jesus, it was Word. The Bible says there are three that testify in heaven, the Father, the Word, not the Father, the Son, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. So it's the Father, God, it's, Father, it's God, the Word, and God, the Spirit. His name was Jesus when he came to earth. The Bible says, John 1, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we called him Emmanuel, God with us. Okay? Jesus gave up the glory of heaven, its splendor, and the lofty place of sitting at the Father's right hand, and came in the weakness of a man. That was his mind. Let this mind... Let that mindset, who didn't say, I deserve to sit up here, but I'll come and meet them where they are. Let this mind be in you. Let me read it. Made himself of no reputation. Verse 8, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore... God highly exalted him. Everyone wants to know how to be lifted up, but they don't want to know how to humble themselves. If you humble yourself, God will exalt you. If you exalt yourself, God will humble you. Gave him a name above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. How do you get to be Lord? You humble yourself. 
to the glory of God the Father. Lord, bless the reading of your word in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Amen. Jesus is nearing the end of his life on earth. We got a thing today we call a bucket list. I don't like to talk about bucket lists because I don't like to think I'm ever going to get old. (laughs) I know inevitably it is happening even though I don't want it to happen. But they are things we want to do before we leave. Some people want to do this. Some people want to meet them. Some people want to go there before they pass on. And Jesus is coming to the end of his life on earth, and last things mean something. And the Son of God has this short tenure here before he's going to die on a cross and be raised and go back to sit at the right hand of the Father. And it is amazing to me that he is interested in washing feet. I don't know that washing feet would make my top 200 list (laughs) on my bucket list. But Jesus is not trying to meet the Roman emperor. Jesus, he's about to go and he's stooping down, grabbing dirty feet and washing them. If you're a casual Christian, you know the story of washing feet. If you're a seeker of the kingdom, you realize there's something bigger going on. I think it is interesting that two times they said, after he had eaten. And having eaten, and he rose up from eating. Two times it talks about having eaten. And then he got the towel and began to serve after he was after he had eaten. When you come into this place to feast and to be fed, the only reason you are being fed is so that you can turn around this week and burn off that meal. The reason people don't come to church hungry and they can miss church so easily and be so casual about missing church is that they have not burnt off last week's meal. So that we are now have a generation of people coming to church that have learned to eat, but we've not trained them to serve. And Jesus only ate so that he could turn around and serve with the fuel of what he just ate. I'm preaching real good right there. I'm concerned that we have a generation of people coming to church that want to be served and are missing the whole point of the life of Jesus who made it plain out of the gate. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but the Son of Man came to serve. He said, I put down my lofty place. I put down my name. I put down my equality in the Godhead. I left my seat at the right hand of the Father, and I became what you needed. You needed a Savior. Listen, I wasn't a Savior. I was Word. I wasn't a savior. I was word. I became a savior because that's what you needed. I was willing to come and be what you needed. I didn't look at the heavenly father and say, this is what I'm willing to do. I looked at him and said, I'll do whatever they need me to do. And he became obedient and humbled himself. And he obeyed. He walked around healing all that were sick and all that were afflicted of the devil. He ran around doing good to all that came in his path. He kept being obedient. He kept teaching when he didn't feel like it. He kept going to houses when he didn't feel like it. He kept casting out devils when he didn't feel like it. He kept raising the dead when he didn't feel like it. He kept listening to the complaints of Pharisees when he didn't heal like it. And he hung on a cross when he didn't feel like it. He didn't come to God and say, I'm willing to be a word. He said, I'll be a savior. I'll be a messiah. I'll be a provider. Whatever they need me to be, I will humble myself. I'll pick up the towel and I will go be what they need me to be. I'm about to go right to that bookstore and buy my own CD. It's amazing to me that we're supposed to eat to go out and serve. You should, by Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, you should start feeling hunger pains for word. You should say, what time does the first service start? 
Why? Because you have served and you have served and you have served and you've given out and you've poured out and you've prayed and you laid hands and you told your friend, I got you back. You go ahead, I'm praying for you. While you go. And you gave and you helped somebody and you went and bought a sack of groceries and you picked them up because their car wouldn't start and you helped when their tire was flat. And you say, wait a minute, that don't sound like Christian stuff. All that's Christian stuff. Christian stuff is showing up and grabbing the towel and saying, what do you need? What do you need? I believe and declare breakthroughs are coming, promotions are coming, healings are coming, new levels of your destiny in Jesus' name. I'm trying to say that your greatest opportunity is sitting in front of you in the form of your greatest problem. You don't fight for anything that you don't believe is yours. When you believe it's yours, you'll turn over tables, you'll kick down doors, and God wants to know, do you believe what I say is yours, is yours? I'm warning every devil to back up because I'm anointed. I'm warning every witch, you can't touch this. I'm anointed. Your spell won't work, your hex won't work, your games, your politics, your scams won't work. Yeah, 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 it's going to be a breakthrough in here tonight. I can feel it building. So God says, when you serve, serve not as unto men. You're doing it as though Jesus himself looked you dead in your eyes over a cup of coffee and said, I need you. In this series, Game Changers, Ron Carpenter coaches you on how God wants you blessed by getting you off the bench and into the game. You're not serving them, you're serving the Lord. It was just God who sent them to get you off the bench and get you in the game. And when you die to you to give yourself to it, Jesus said, him who serves me, my God will honor. And this is what he told me. He said, pastor, you've got to understand, I'm just as anointed to help as you are to preach. This eight message series is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call now and we will include free shipping and an MP3 download card. Call now or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen. The same attitude should come when you come to the house of God. The house of God has needs. I have a vision not to build a great church. I have a vision to change a region. A region which they're saying can't be reached. A region which magazines are saying is the most unchristian region in all of America. I am just bodacious enough in my faith to say God don't want to just fill up a building that I believe God wants to use us to turn around and serve the Bay Area and the Silicon Valley to change a region and cause them to say, what is it that makes them serve the way they serve? What They don't even know who I am. Why are they having a towel and coming and running to my car to meet my needs? I don't understand. So when you can't talk them into the kingdom, you serve them into the kingdom. Because serving is the pathway to open up a person's heart. Open up your wife's heart, serve them. Open up your husband's heart, serve them. I'm losing my claps now. You want to open up a city's heart, serve it. You want to open up the world's heart serve it. The world is tired of seeing the church take. They want to see us grab a towel and say, what do you need? Ah. Ah. Tell your neighbor, say, he's talking to you. He's talking straight to you. You, I know the Bible says don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, but I felt the liberty from God just to, to share you, to demonstrate what I'm talking about and the way me and Hope try to live. We try to live our life this way. <clears throat> my, my middle son, um, one of his good friends growing up, went through a time when his, when his home was broken up and he, he began to spiral downward fast. And although his great mother, great father, to this day, he m began to make some decisions that just alienated him from his whole family. <clears throat> Dropped out of school, brilliant kid, great grades, just quit. <laughs> no car, no job. Whoever let him sleep over that night, he'd just sleep there on their couch. And he was just living place to place, house to house, dead in. And this kid with this bright future, I mean, just, and we had known him most of his life. It's painful to watch. 
I went and got him one day. And I told him, I said, I'm going to make a deal with you. I said, you go back and get your GED. I said, I don't want to hear no excuses. I said, you go back and get your GED. I said, I'll buy you a car so you can get to work. I said, I'll buy you one. He looked at me, his eyes lit up. He's like, are you being for real? I'm like, you go get it. He went back. It took him a little over a year. He went back and he came to my house and handed me his GED. I walked right out and went and bought him a car. Then I looked at him and I said, you want to take this to the next level? I said, I want to see you work an entry level job for a year and be faithful. I said, I want you to do your best. And I said, I want to see you take care of this car. And I said, in a year from now, we'll send you to college. A year later, that car was the shiniest car you had ever seen in your life. A woman could put on her makeup looking in the paint on that thing. <laughs> and he had been faithful working a job, and my wife picked up a phone and called a university president and had him $20,000 in scholarship in a five-minute conversation. <laughs> And then we put the rest of the money that went with it, and we sent that young boy to college. And now three years later, he's going into his senior year, and he has now had the businessman who built two of the dorms for that university and built its library has now picked him out of everybody in the student body and taken him under his wing. He's an unbelievably multi-millionaire, maybe close to billionaire status, and he wants to personally mentor him and train him in business. And I got a call about two months ago. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm a crybaby. He called me. He said, he said, I just had to say thank you. He said, you stepping in has changed the whole trajectory of my life. The whole trajectory. And during the first service, unbeknownst to me, I was sent this message. His mother was watching online. <laughs> Pastors run in hope. I watched your service with tears running down my face. The words thank you don't seem adequate, but thank you from the bottom of my heart. What you have done for my son has forever changed his life. He is another person. At one point, he didn't even believe there was a God. And now he's telling me weekly he's praying for me. We have the most wonderful relationship. He tells me he wants to turn around and take care of me. Now I pray that God will bless me so that I can turn around and do something life-changing for somebody else. I'm good for a month. I'm good for a month. I'm good. That's better than a thousand Christmas presents. That's better than a thousand thank you cards. That's better than everybody telling me that was a great sermon. That means more to me. Take your time. What do they need? Take your towel and serve whatever that need is. I dare you to tell about five people, say, it's time to grab a towel. Point at them. It's time to grab a towel. It is time to grab a towel. God Almighty. So what attitude do we take? Deuteronomy 8. Moses has gotten them out of Egypt. His time is coming to an end. Listen to me. For those of you that don't like prosperity, this scripture is about to make you itch. You're going to need cortisone shot after I read this right here. <laughs> Moses, Joshua's about to take over. The time of dwelling in a desert is over, and they're about to go into a land with fortified walls, houses they didn't build, vineyards they didn't plant, wells they didn't dig, and a land flowing with milk and honey. 
And listen at Moses' last words. This is the last book he wrote, Deuteronomy. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God. Not keeping his commandments, judges, statutes, which I command you today, verse 12. Lest when you have eaten and are full. What did Jesus do as soon as he ate? He got up and burned off his last meal serving. Listen at the warning. Lest when you have eaten and you're full. In other words, you've taken care of you. And have built beautiful houses. Dwell in them. Verse 13. And when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold multiplied and all that you have is multiplied. Oh, you poverty people, don't that just make you want to... God's a prosperity God. He said everything's going to multiply. He said, I'm going to bless you. But he's given a warning in the blessing. It's not bad to be blessed if you can just keep the warnings. When your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord God. In other words, when it gets good, better be careful that you don't forget who put you there. The Lord God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, verse 15, who led you through that great and terrible wilderness in which the fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land. He said, you better remember, it wasn't always like this. He said, and you remember when you couldn't help yourself who brought you out. I fed you, I kept you, the serpents were biting you, but I wouldn't let the poison kill you. The venom from the scorpion came, I didn't let it kill you. I saved you from thirst, I saved you from hunger, I kept you cool in the day, I kept you warm at night. And when you get your pretty house built, don't you forget. Verse 16, who brought water for you. Excuse me, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do, to do you good in the end. Verse 17. Then you say in your heart, you don't say it out loud, but you say it in here, my power and the might of my hand hath gained me well. He said, don't let me put you there and then you think you had something to do with it. Verse 18. And you shall remember the Lord God, for it is he who gives you the power to get well. That he may establish his covenant, he swore to his fathers. God said, if I take you to a good place, it's so that you turn around in the earth and you let all the peoples of the earth know how good I am in my covenant with you. I got to be honest with you, sometime I'll bless you and God ain't even got you in mind. Is it that God gave me money and he didn't even intend me to have money? He knew that boy needed a life change. And God says, I'm blessing you, but this ain't even for you. I'm blessing you because you're not a reservoir, you're a stream. And as one of my old mentors used to say, if God can get it through you, he'll send it to you. So God says, when you serve, serve not as unto men. You're doing it as though Jesus himself looked you dead in your eyes over a cup of coffee and said, I need you. In this series, Game Changers, Ron Carpenter coaches you on how God wants you blessed by getting you off the bench and into the game. You're not serving them, you're serving the Lord. It was just God who sent them to get you off the bench and get you in the game. And when you die to you to give yourself to it, Jesus said, him who serves me, my God will honor. And this is what he told me. He said, pastor, you've got to understand, I'm just as anointed to help as you are to preach. This eight message series is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call now and we will include free shipping and an MP3 download card. Call now or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen.
Guys, you know what? We're still kind of on the front side of Game Changers, and I hope that you're enjoying it because I really came at the truths concerning serving from so many different angles. I think it can give you a broad perspective of exactly the blessing that comes when we take that serv that attitude of servitude and everything that we do, especially when it comes to making the house of God great and preferring our brothers and our neighbors over ourselves. I got to go into a moment of thank yous. You know, this is a time where we talk to you about the fact that we are viewer supported and so many of you have been doing it and it's been doing it so faithfully so long, but I need to stop and say thank you uh, for the extra that you did uh, for Hope's recent Pakistan trip. You know, many of you gave and we, we didn't even make a, a big push. We didn't even talk really a whole lot about it. Uh, it was her first time going and taking Marilyn Hickey's place. Marilyn Hickey placed that mantle upon her. But uh, we're going to begin showing you footage and showing you pictures of just those of you that gave what it went to and those of you that didn't get on it this year, how next year you can be a part of that. It just, in some ways, the most exhilarating thing you'll ever see and in some other ways, just some images that are difficult to look at. But the fact is the love of God traveled across the seas and came to a group of people that were so hungry to feel his love and you helped make that happen. And I'm grateful to you. We are viewer supported. And I just wanna open up our family of partners to you. Maybe you just like to give a one-time gift and you've been blessed, or maybe you say, you know what, I believe in what they're doing. I believe in the message that God's given them, and I wanna help it go to the whole world. We're diligently working to expand, to be better, to reach further, to translate into other languages, to touch everybody with the message of Jesus and his kingdom, and I need your help. So if you've been given, thank you. I'd ask you to continually to prayerfully support us and financially support us. If you never have and you're thinking about it, just listen to what God's saying. Listen to that tug in your heart. Just obey Him. That's the main voice you need to obey. And for whatever you do, whether it be a covenant partner or just a first-time gift, for your first gift, we're going to give this right here to you to say thank you and let you know that we place value on the fact that you placed value on us. We're so grateful. I want you to go out if you would and follow me on Instagram, Twitter, follow me on Facebook. Why? Because I get to talk to you a whole lot more than I do right here. Always a word of encouragement, sometimes a prayer time, sometimes just a prophetic word, sometimes God just lays something on my heart, sometimes a devotional, sometimes a quote. You never know, but something to sustain that passion for God. We can give it to you on a daily basis. So I'd love to hook up with you there and get to know you even deeper. Thank you so much for everything you do. May God just encourage you and may this be the greatest week you've ever had. I'll see you real soon. Join us every week for another exciting message from Ron Carpenter. And until then, visit us online at roncarpenter.com and discover encouraging resources to help you reach your greatest potential in your Christian walk. And when you visit, consider partnering with our ministry team to help us take this life-changing message to the world. Our goal is to take the message and ministry of Ron Carpenter to a worldwide audience, but we can only do it with your help. And don't forget to connect with Ron every day through social media. Thank you so much for being a part of this ministry, and we'll see you again next time for another challenging message with Ron Carpenter.